Good evening and welcome to the seventh session of our course, Greek History and Civilization, 700 BC, give or take a bit, to 500 AD, and we may get as far as 500 AD, but don't hold your breath. Today I want to talk about Alexander the Great, and to talk about Alexander the Great in one session does the most extreme and gross disservice to the subject, but I have no choice but to give an overview and to be ruthlessly selective. But I'll do what I can with it. The opening image, that is a photograph that I took with my telephone, not with my expensive camera, and it's partly because I saw what my telephone could do that I got rid of the expensive camera. That's a photograph that I took in the National Archaeological Museum in Istanbul at the end of 2022, yes. It's the Alexander sarcophagus, and this is said to be an image of Alexander made within living memory of Alexander's conquests. This is an image of Alexander overcoming the Persians at the Battle of Issus. Quite a nice image and it's entirely relevant to this particular part of the course. Let's set the scene, however. Although the Greeks expanded after about 700 BC, all around the shores of the Mediterranean, very heavy Greek settlements all around the Black Sea, Greek settlements in Italy, Greek settlements in southern France, some Greek settlements in Spain, and Greek settlements on the northern shores of Africa. Although the Greeks had settled in fairly intensively the shores of the Mediterranean from about 700 BC onwards, the Greeks were always a marginal people. They never penetrated far inland, except in their home territory, the Lower Balkan Peninsula, and the Lower Balkan Peninsula, or what is now modern Greece, was always under pressure. You can see with this map of Greece on the eve of the Peloponnesian War that Greece doesn't extend very far to the north. Once you get beyond Larissa, you're heading into Macedonia. The Macedonians were not always regarded as Greeks. And once you turn east, once you get inland a few miles from the western coast of Asia Minor, you're outside the Greek areas. People may still speak Greek, but you're in areas of Persian control. And so the Greeks, you might say, were always clinging by their fingernails to their homeland. Indeed, this is a map of Greece around 431 BC, and pay attention to those yellow bits on the right-hand side of the map, on the western coast of Asia Minor. 30 years later, if we move, there we are, there's Greece around 404 BC, at the end of the Peloponnesian War, and you can see that most of the coast of Asia Minor has been taken back by the Persians. That was a rather dirty deal between the Persians and the Spartans. The Spartans told the Persians, oh, you can have those bits back, just give us money to build a fleet, and we'll look the other way. And that was the deal, and the Spartans and the Persians both delivered on it, and so those Greek cities, Ephesus, Smyrna, Miletus, and so on, they found themselves back under Persian control, and then during the 4th century, the Persians tightened their grip over Greece, not by conquering it with weapons this time. The Persians had got a bloody nose in the 480s and 470s, and they weren't going to repeat that. They conquered Greece with gold. They conquered Greece with bribes. They bought the politicians up, and they hoped that they could turn Greece into a set of satellite states, partly because they wanted to rule Greece, but also because, as I keep on saying, it's difficult to run a great empire when you have a turbulent border, and the Greeks were undoubtedly turbulent. But whatever the case, the Greeks were under pressure. 
there was no reason to suppose that they would be able to maintain their independence even in their homelands. And look again at the Persian Empire. It is vast. This is the Persian Empire at its greatest extent. By about 340 BC, it's rather smaller. The Macedonians under Philip II have cleared the Persians out of Europe. So the Persian Empire starts across the Straits. The Persians have lost southern Egypt and probably some of those areas in the east were, had always been conjectural at best and now were effectively independent of Persia. But give or take a few losses here and a few gains there, the Persian Empire remained the largest and the richest and the most powerful empire that had ever existed until that time, and the Persians were breathing down Greek necks. That was around 350 BC, that was the case in 337 BC, that was very much the case in 336 BC. And then, let's start at 336 BC, 13 years later, 323 BC, this is the new shape of the world. This is the empire conquered by a joint force of Macedonians and Greeks under the leadership of Alexander. The Greeks, because let's include the Macedonians under the heading of Greeks, the Greeks have conquered the entirety of the Persian Empire. They now control Egypt with its vast wealth. They control the whole of what is now the Middle East. They have Israel, Jordan, Lebanon. They have the whole of Turkey. They have Iraq. They have Iran. They have all the way down into the Indian Ocean. They have Afghanistan. They have great chunks of India. All of this is ruled by Greeks, and much of this retains a Greek impress for many hundreds of years afterwards. And so this is a total change in the balance of power within the Western Hemisphere, a completely unexpected change. I don't think the Greeks ever expected that this would happen. I'm not even convinced that Alexander himself knew that this would happen, and I don't believe that this was part of Philip's agenda when he called everyone together at the League of Corinth and got a declaration of war on Persia. It is a total transformation of the status of the Greeks within the eastern Mediterranean, within the Levant, and within much of Central Asia. The Greeks are no longer a privileged but subject nationality, the Greeks are now the masters, and Greek becomes the main international language of the Mediterranean world, all the way down to the Indian Ocean, and it remains the main international language for more than a thousand years after the death of Alexander. So this is the scale of what Alexander achieved, Indeed, this is the geographical scale of what Alexander achieved. Talking about the cultural significance, oh, I'd better get on with things if I want even to mention that. But that is what happened in a 13-year period. The Greeks went from a somewhat marginal people into masters of the Mediterranean and of Central Asia. So let's see how this happened. It starts in 359, and I'm going over what I discussed last week, but call it a recapitulation. It starts in 359, when Philip II becomes king of Macedon. He uses a gold find within his kingdom, or a gold find in what would soon be part of his kingdom, to set about remodelling the Macedonian armed forces and Macedonian society, with the express intention of conquering and uniting all of the Greeks. He did this with firm ruthlessness and efficiency, so well that by 337 BC he controlled the whole of Greece, with the exception of Sparta, 
the Spartans remained ostentatiously aloof from the League of Corinth, but the Spartans by now were not tremendously important, so Philip ignored them. And I think it's worth quoting George Orwell on this. We have discussed before the start of this session to what extent the Macedonians were Greeks. I said that that is an open question. The Greeks didn't always regard the Macedonians as fully Greek. And this may be one of the facts that drove Philip and that certainly drove Alexander, who, although half Greek, was also half Macedonian. George Orwell said, Notes on Nationalism 1944, One quite commonly finds that great national leaders or the founders of nationalist movements do not even belong to the country they have glorified. Sometimes they are outright foreigners, or more often they come from peripheral areas where nationality is doubtful. Examples are Stalin, he was a Georgian, not a Russian, Hitler, he was an Austrian, not a German, Napoleon from Corsica, De Valera, the Irish leader, well, that's not a very Gaelic name, is it? Disraeli, Jewish, Poincaré, and I'm not sure where he was from, I just always thought he was French, and Beaverbrook, Canadian. So that's a good list of nationalist leaders who were not entirely from the countries that they glorified, and he might have added to that list Philip of Macedon and Alexander the Great. They were not fully Greek, or they were not regarded as fully Greek, but they decided to be Greeks, and they decided to glorify the Greeks, and they did so with conspicuous success. Remember, F Philip called all of the Greek states subject to his control together to a conference in Corinth in 337. The Spartans refused to take part, but as I said, the Spartans didn't matter. In order to unify these territories, which had for time out of mind been at war with each other, it was necessary to go somewhat beyond stationing Macedonian garrisons and saying, no, you're not going to war with each other, I am the master now. In order to unify these territories, it was useful to have an external enemy. There was no point declaring a crusade, one might call, against the northern barbarians, because although they were dangerous, Philip had largely pacified them, and Alexander would continue the work of pacification. They were a long way off, and they didn't matter too much. No, they were the Persians to the east. They were the great historic enemy of the Greek people. So, at the League of Corinth, Philip got a joint declaration of war by all of the Greek states and by the Kingdom of Macedon against Persia, and the alleged reason for this was revenge for Xerxes' invasion of Greece and his burning of Greek temples. I think the main intention was to invade the western part of the Persian Empire and to liberate the Greek cities on the western coast of Asia Minor. I'm not sure, indeed I don't believe for a moment, that Philip's ambition went beyond this. Then... Philip was assassinated, and it seemed that all of his plans would fall to the ground, because there was a power vacuum in Macedon, and the person who stepped in to fill that vacuum was his son Alexander, who was still very young. He was only 20. Alexander, though, and one mustn't forget his mother Olympias, indeed one mustn't forget her at all, Alexander was no ordinary 20-year-old. As soon as he managed to get himself declared king after Philip's death, and he and his mother may well have brought about Philip's death, but as soon as Philip was dead and Alexander was king of Macedon, he set about a purge of the Macedonian royal family. He killed three of his cousins. He killed his uncle Attalus. He didn't kill his half-brother, Philip Aridaeus, because Philip was mentally subnormal, or he was seriously disabled by an earlier attempt by his mother to poison him. 
Philip had cast off Alexander's mother, Olympias, towards the end, and he'd married a young woman called Cleopatra, who had given birth to a child. That may have brought on Philip's murder. As soon as she was able, Olympias, the mother of Alexander, got hold of poor young Cleopatra, had her baby daughter tied to her, had Cleopatra tied to a stake, and had her burned to death. And apparently, while Cleopatra was screaming in the flames, Olympias danced around the funeral pyre, rejoicing that she had won. That was a bit too much even for Alexander. He told his mother off, but it didn't matter. It removed any last competition. Alexander was now the only legitimate heir. He was now the undisputed king of Macedon. Unfinished business. The first was a quick dash across the Danube to subdue various troublesome Celtic tribes who were making trouble. You then have two sets of revolts in southern Greece in 335. The Greeks were misinformed. They thought that Philip was dead and that the Macedonian crown had passed onto the head of a boy who could be safely ignored. Instead, Alexander swept south. He forgave the Athenians immediately because he needed their navy. But Thebes, which had been one of the projectors of this revolt, was ruthlessly stamped on. The city was destroyed, burned, the men were massacred, the women and children led off into slavery. After that, there was no further trouble in Greece. Well, there was, some years later, by the Spartans, but they were no particular trouble. So Alexander has stepped into his father's shoes, and he takes up his father's project of punishing the barbarians of invading Persia as an act of revenge for the invasion by Xerxes. So in 334, Alexander crosses to Asia with 48,000 soldiers, which includes the best trained and equipped army in the world at that time, the Macedonian army, plus a large number of recruits from the Greek states, 6,100 cavalry, almost entirely Macedonian, and a fleet of 120 ships with crews of 38,000, and these were supplied by the Athenians. The king of Persia had seen this coming. The Persians had spies in Macedon. They knew what was going on. They knew that Philip was planning to invade them. They knew in advance that Alexander was going to invade them. But they didn't regard this as a particularly serious matter. That it would be little more than a raid. As soon as Alexander crossed the straits into Asia, the satrap of Sardis, that is the western capital of the Persian Empire, gathered together an army and went out to repulse these, this incursion. May 334... The satrap of Sardis met Alexander at the river Granicus. Although Alexander was outnumbered, and although he fought on unfavourable ground, he won a total victory over the Persian army. An unexpected victory over the Persian army, because there were no other Persian forces in the western part of the empire, Immediately, Alexander took over the western coast of Asia Minor. With a single battle, he cleared the Persians out of all the Greek areas in what is now western Turkey. Indeed, he was able to take over a great deal more of the Persian Empire than he might have expected. At this point, the Persian king, Darius III, decided that this was something that he needed to attend to in person. So he gathered together a gigantic army, and he marched out from Persepolis, and he met Alexander at Issus, which is that red dot quite close to the Mediterranean coast. Can you see it on that map? He expected that with his overpoweringly superior army, he would sweep Alexander and his, and his Greeks into the sea and take back everything that the satrap of Sardis had inadvertently lost. Instead, 
Alexander inflicted a crushing defeat on the Persians. It was such an absolute defeat that the king, Darius III, towards the end of the battle, turned his chariot and rode away from the battle. He rode away, leaving his nobles to die in his cause. Indeed, he went away with nothing but the chariot that he was riding at the time. Alexander won the lot. He took the Persian camp. That included much of the Persian treasury. It also included the whole family of Darius III, his two daughters and his son, his wife and his mother. His mother, Sisygambus, was so outraged that she announced that she was no mother of Darius, and because she got on very well with Alexander, she announced that he was her son from now on. Alexander treated the Persian royal family with marked respect, and he indeed married one of Darius's daughters. And with this victory, the Persian Empire collapsed in the West. The whole of it fell into Alexander's hands. Oh, some of it still needed to be fought over. In 332, Alexander swept down into Syria, and he took Tyre, which was rather... It was rather a difficult siege. It was nine months and he had to build a causeway and so on. But then after Tyre, there was nothing stopping him from Egypt. So Alexander carried on to Egypt. He had to fight a battle in the Gaza Strip. But uh, once he was through that, he was into Egypt. The Egyptians took one look at him and declared him their pharaoh. Alexander has taken what is now most of Western Turkey. He's taken Syria, he's taken Lebanon, he's taken Israel, and he's taken Egypt. He has the whole Western part of the Persian Empire. Darius has disappeared to the east, and he opens a correspondence with Alexander, negotiating with increasing, increasingly desperate generosity to offer him part of the empire, but Alexander refuses. Eventually, after he's taken Syria and Egypt, and he's back in Asia Minor, Alexander marches east, and he meets Darius at Galgamela, or Arbela, number of names. Again, Darius has a vastly superior army, in numbers, a numerically superior army, and this is his last throw. He's hoping that he can overpower Alexander because he knows roughly how the Macedonians will set about fighting the battle. He hopes that he can crush Alexander here and gain everything back. Instead, Alexander inflicts another total defeat on the Persians. And once again, Darius jumps into his chariot and rides away leaving his soldiers to fight on to the death. After this, the Persian nobility, which has already had a number of obvious misgivings about the abilities of Darius, give up on the poor man. What they do is they take him prisoner, lead him around various parts of the eastern Persian Empire, and eventually they murder him. There is a claim, which originates with Alexander himself, there is a claim that on his deathbed, or on the ground where he was bleeding his last, Darius named Alexander his heir, which would be convenient, but it doesn't matter, because the entire surviving Persian nobility, which had the power to do this, waited for Darius to be safely dead, and then elected Alexander the new king of Persia, so he didn't need to fight any more battles. He was now the king of Persia. Because Alexander was married to Darius's daughter, and because Darius was Alexander's father-in-law, Alexander took his murder badly. It was a convenient murder, no doubt, but Alexander took it badly. He had the murderers rounded up and put to death in some rather bloodthirsty ways. One of the ways involved tying someone between two saplings which were bent down and then releasing them so he got torn in half, his arms and legs torn away and the body bounced all over the place. 
The ancients had some rather unpleasant ways of putting each other to death, but then again, human beings in general manage that. So Alexander is now the king of Persia. How was it that Alexander could defeat the Persians? You can look at it in two ways. You can say that the Persians had been rotted by luxury and general oriental decadence ever since the time of Darius the Great, and you can see the effects of this decadence in the defeat of Xerxes in 479. There is something to that, I suppose. Or you can simply say that in the 4th century, the Persian Empire drifted into one of those periods of weak central government, which are endemic to Oriental-style emperors. What happened, it seems, is that a eunuch called Bagoas, he was the vizier to Artaxerxes III, the vizier or the prime minister, he was competent, but he was very ambitious because he was a eunuch and because he wasn't a member of the royal family. He couldn't make himself king of Persia, but he wanted to be the power behind the throne. So, first of all, he had Artaxerxes III poisoned. He replaced Artaxerxes III with Artaxerxes IV who conspires against Bagoas. He doesn't want to be king in name only, he wants to be the king. And so Bagoas poisons him as well. He then chooses somebody regarded as safe but mediocre, Darius III. So he's made the king of Persia. Darius III, although not hugely competent when it came to fighting battles, knew how to stay alive, and so he poisoned Bagoas and tried to establish himself as the sole power in the Persian Empire. The Persian Empire at the centre in the 330s has fallen into an inconvenient period of instability at the centre. There's no reason to suppose that the Persian Empire itself was much less than it had been in the days of Darius the Great but it was inconvenient for the Persians that they did not have an effective central government at the time when Alexander led his army across the Straits. And you have a reasonably balanced description of Darius III by Arian, a 2nd century AD Greek writer who wrote a biography of Alexander. Darius's life was an unbroken series of disasters from the moment of his accession to the throne. He was immediately faced by the defeat of his satraps and their mounted troops on the Granicus. Then came his own defeat at Issus and the bitter sight of his mother, wife and children as prisoners in enemy hands. The loss of Phoenicia and Egypt was followed by the debacle at Arbela or Galgamela, use whichever name you prefer, his own shameful flight from the field and the destruction of the mightiest army of the whole East. Then, a homeless fugitive in the land he once ruled, ruthlessly betrayed by his own guards, a monarch in chains contemptuously smuggled away from the scene of his former glory, he was finally murdered by the treachery of those most bound in duty to serve him. Such was the unhappy life of Darius. Dead, he was more fortunate, for he was buried in the royal tomb, his children were given by Alexander the same upbringing and education they would have had had he still been king, and his daughter became Alexander's wife. He was about fifty when he died. I think a fairly balanced judgment of Darius III, an unlucky, as well as not a particularly competent monarch, well-meaning, but no match for Alexander. That's a 15th century representation of the murder of Darius, and there in yellow is Alexander, who has sworn to avenge the murder of his father-in-law. I've said that Alexander swept into Egypt and got himself made pharaoh. While he was in Egypt, Alexander did two very important things. The first is that he decided that the new capital of Egypt, 
should not be Memphis deep inland on the Nile. It shouldn't be Thebes far to the south on the Nile. Instead, Egypt would face onto the Mediterranean from now on. So he established a new city on the Mediterranean coast, which he called Alexandria. And if you look at this map, which is rather important, you'll see that Alexandria is served by one of those branches of the Nile Delta. So you can sail from Alexandria into the Nile. And if you look at this spur going from the Nile, most of that is an artificial canal which joins the Nile to the Red Sea. So Alexandria is joined by a series of waterways from the Mediterranean down to the Red Sea, which allows Alexandria to become an enormously large and wealthy city, the main point of contact between the East and the West. And Alexandria, for at least a thousand years, and for some time after, was the main centre for the distribution of silk, spice, and all other things from the East, Alexandria was also a notable manufacturing city, and one of its most noted exports was high-quality glassware. Indeed, one of my students is Korean, and she tells me that fairly recently an ancient Korean tomb was opened, and it was filled with Alexandrian glassware. So, one of Alexander's most significant achievements in Egypt was to found the city of Alexandria, its new capital, filled with Greeks. His other notable achievement, and you can see this on the gold coin, which I photographed in the British Museum, is that he became a god. And here is the relevant part of Plutarch's life of Alexander. Alexander travelled across the desert from the new Alexandria to an oracle far to the west in a place called Siwa, or Zeus Ammon. He approached the priest, who was an Egyptian, but who spoke some Greek. The priest didn't speak it very well. He knew that Alexander was coming, and he wanted to be polite, and so I'll read the Plutarch. The priest who wished as a mark of courtesy to address him in Greek with the words, O Pydon, or O my son, because of his foreign accent, pronounced the last letter as a sigma instead of a nu, and said it as O Pydios, son of Zeus, and that Alexander was delighted at this slip of pronunciation, and hence the legend grew up that the god had addressed him as son of Zeus. The story's probably true, it has a ring of truth about it. A very convenient claim that Alexander could make, though, was that he had been declared a god. He was a son of Zeus, and in future he was no longer some common or garden king of Macedon, or even a future king of Persia. He was now a god in his own right, and you can see that shown on his coins. So Alexander is the master of the East, and he's also a god. Many of his Greek and Macedonian followers, many of his Greek and Macedonian generals, were not at all pleased by this. They laughed at it. They rejected it with scorn. But Alexander soon made sure that they, would, that they wouldn't make too much of a fuss. And one of his close friends, Cletus the Black, who mocked his pretensions to divinity and even said, your father was a better man than you are. He wasn't drunk all the time and he also built the army that you've used to conquer Asia. Well, for saying that, Alexander picked up a spear and killed his friend. Alexander, shall we say, put on airs and graces after he became a god and once he became the king of Persia, he insisted that everybody... Greeks, Persians, Macedonians, it didn't matter what, everybody should perform a full Eastern prostration in front of him. That is, that when you're allowed into the royal presence, you must throw yourself down on a carpet and bang your head three times on the ground as a mark of respect. The proskinesis, or the full prostration, 
The Greeks found that outrageous. The Macedonians found it more than outrageous. But Alexander was able to demand it, and that's what he got. Alexander wanted to conquer the world, or at least so I'm told, and he marched into India. He was going to conquer the whole of India. He didn't get that far into India, but he did get quite a way into the country, and he fought a battle in the Punjab in 326, the Battle of the River Hydaspes. He fought it against one of the local kings, Porus. Porus used elephants, and that was the first experience the Greeks had had of elephants. It was something they took back west with them, and eventually the Carthaginians used elephants against the Romans with considerable success. And when the Romans conquered Britain in the first century AD, in the last battle, the Emperor Claudius sent elephants to work on the British tribes. Indeed, I believe the victory procession through Winchester at the end of the Roman conquest involved having the Emperor Claudius sat on the back of an elephant to be carried through the streets of Winchester. But although Alexander won the Battle of Hydaspes, it was an expensive victory. He took many losses. He's now thousands of miles from Greece and Macedon. He tells his soldiers, we carry on. We take India, and then there's a place called China beyond that. We'll have that as well. At this point, the soldiers mutiny. They say, no, no, that's it. We're not carrying on. We want to go home. We're so far from our homelands that we can't even measure it. We, we want to go home. Alexander had no choice. He was bitterly disappointed. He was outraged. But he started the march back towards the Mediterranean. It seems that he punished his army by marching it through the Gedrosian Desert, where half the men died of thirst. But nobody seemed inclined to turn back for India. They just pressed forward. Eventually, Alexander got back into Persian territory. He got back into territory that the Greeks recognised. It was not their world, but it wasn't considerably beyond the edge of their world. And he got back to Babylon in 323 BC. And here we have a number of accounts of his death. We'll start with Plutarch, because he's probably the most accurate of the biographers. He took himself once more to sacrifices and drinking bouts. He gave a splendid entertainment to Nearchus. And then, although he'd taken his customary bath before going to bed... At the request of Medius, he went to hold high revel with him, and here, after drinking all the next day, he began to have a fever. This did not come upon him after he had quaffed a bowl of Heracles, nor after he had been seized with a sudden pain in the back as though smitten with a spear. These particulars certain writers felt obliged to give, and so, as it were, invented in tragic fashion a moving finale for a great action. But... Aristobulus says that he had a raging fever and that when he got very thirsty he drank wine, whereupon he became delirious and died on the 13th, or died on the 10th of June 323. How Alexander died is a mystery. It's possible that he died from alcohol poisoning. He was a confirmed alcoholic, let's say. He was almost never sober didn't stop him from winning battles, but he was a terrible drunk. Or it's possible that he died of cholera or dysentery. Babylon in the summer is not a wonderful place without air conditioning. Or he may have died of a lung infection. He took an arrow wound in his lung, which never healed. And towards the end, breathing was a continual pain for him. He may have died of an infection from that. Or it's possible that he was poisoned by his own generals because he had taken to having them put to death. He was beginning to behave like one of the madder Roman emperors. And although you may respect Alexander, you may admire him immensely, if you see him giving you funny looks, you may think, well, it's him or me, so where's that bottle of poison? 
Whatever the case, Alexander died in Babylon on the 10th of June 323. His end was rather dignified. Quintus Curtius is rather good. He bade his friends draw near, since by now even his voice had started to fail, and then took his ring from his finger and handed it to Perdiccas, one of his senior generals. He also gave instructions that they should have his body transported to Hammon, that is the place in Egypt, where he had been declared a god. When they asked him to whom he bequeathed his kingdom, he answered, to the best man. Well, that's not a very good translation. To the strongest may have been what he said, but added that he could already foresee great funeral gains for himself provided by that issue. When Perdiccas further asked when he wished divine honours paid to him, he said he wanted them when they themselves were enjoying good fortunes. These were last. These were Alexander's last words. He died moments later. He then stayed in the death room for five days while his generals withdrew to another room and began arguing over what to do with his empire which is perfectly reasonable. Alexander's dead, he's no longer of any account, and so the question is, who is going to take this empire? They argued for days and days and days, while Alexander remained, at the hottest time of year, in the room where he'd died. Eventually, the Egyptian embalmers were allowed into the room, but they found that the body hadn't decayed, the body wasn't a mass of putrefying filth, which you might have expected in that climate. Instead, he lay there, apparently still alive, and that gives credence to the claims that he was poisoned. If he'd been poisoned with one of the metallic poisons, then his body wouldn't have decayed, would it? After that, he wasn't mummified according to the Egyptian custom, which involved removing all of the inner organs soaking the body until it was a dried-out husk and wrapping it in bandages. What happened was he was dropped into a vat of honey and he was kept in a glass jar for the next thousand years, as far as I can tell. The last reference to Alexander's body was around 400 AD. It was grabbed by Ptolemy, his school friend, who took over Egypt and eventually became the pharaoh of Egypt. Ptolemy grabbed Alexander's body as it was being taken back to Macedon for burial and had it put on display in Alexandria. Augustus, or rather Octavian still, when he turned up in Egypt in 30 BC, paid respects to Alexander's mummy, scattering flowers on the glass jar and... There are incidental mentions of the body for the next few hundred years. So his body had a long history. Every so often someone claims to have found the tomb of Alexander, but there is no reason to suppose he ever had a tomb. It could be that after Christianity became the established faith of the Roman Empire, that the body was taken off display and buried somewhere, but if so, we haven't found that tomb. So that is the end of Alexander. I haven't said very much about his battles, but then you see, I've always found battles rather boring. They're just long accounts of mass murder. The consequences of those battles, the causes of those battles, I've always found those much more interesting. So I'm not going to say things like, and now when the Persians advanced across the river, the Macedonian cavalry came down on the left, but withdrew at this moment in a flanking attack. No, I'm not going to do that. That's not the way I do history, I'm afraid. If you want to see plans of the battles, the internet's full of them, but it's a bit beyond me. There's a representation of Alexander's death in Babylon. It's rather a nice one. It probably looked a bit like that. He's surrounded by his Greek and Persian generals. They're all waiting for him to die. They will pay their last respects, and then they'll hurry next door and start arguing over who gets what. I've said that Alexander was an alcoholic. He wasn't just an alcoholic. He was also a monster. 
let's have a look at some of the things that he did. After taking Tyre in 332, that's a city on the coast of what was then Syria, he needed to take Tyre so that he could move on to take Egypt. After taking Tyre, Alexander ordered all but those who had fled to the temples to be put to death and the buildings to be set on fire. Although these orders were made public by heralds, no Tyrian underarms deigned to seek protection from the gods. Young boys and girls had filled the temples, but the men all stood in the vestibules of their own homes, ready to face the fury of their enemy. The extent of the bloodshed can be judged from the fact that 6,000 fighting men were slaughtered within the city's fortifications. It was a sad spectacle that the furious king then provided for the victors. 2,000 Tyrians who had survived the rage of the tiring Macedonians now hung nailed to crosses all along the huge expanse of the beach. Also, when his best friend and occasional lover, Hephaestion, died in Babylon, Alexander was so overcome with grief that he ordered a mass human sacrifice in commemoration of his friend's death. The funeral was attended by human sacrifices. Also, the doctor who'd failed to save the life of Hephaestion was crucified. Alexander was capable of extreme brutality. He was capable of extreme brutality to people he'd never met, just ordering large numbers of little people to be put to the sword. He was also ruthless with regard to his own friends. Quite a few of them ended dead after the Persian conquest began, and they were killed by orders of Alexander, or sometimes at his own hand. Also, the governor of Gaza, the Persian governor, who defended the town very bravely and stopped Alexander from advancing into Egypt. When Gaza fell, the Persian commander was taken before him. He didn't show Alexander the respect that Alexander required, and so Alexander's punishment was that the man should be tied naked to a chariot and pulled over stony ground until he was torn to pieces. One mustn't romanticise Alexander. If you've ever read Mary Reno's The Persian Boy, which I greatly enjoyed as a child, but if you've ever read Mary Reno's The Persian Boy, still much recommended, you'll see that Alexander is an almost Christ-like figure, filled with good intentions, and that if he occasionally did something that was questionable, why that's something that he regretted afterwards, or that was reasonable in the circumstances. But again, you should see Alexander as he appears to have been, not as people would like him to have been. He was capable of great generosity, he was also capable of the most disgusting cruelty to everyone around him. And as I said, he was a terrible drunk. A bad combination. Unlimited power, great ability, alcoholism, and a general lack of restraint. It wouldn't surprise me if his generals had poisoned him at the end. The burning of Persepolis. I won't go on about that. He burned the Persian capital. When he became king of Persia, he didn't conquer Persepolis. He walked into it. He was the new king. But he had a wine-soaked feast to celebrate his capture of Persepolis. In the course of this, the mistress of his boyhood friend Ptolemy, the later pharaoh of Egypt, suggested that Persepolis had been the capital of some very wicked kings, and that Alexander should now burn the place down as punishment for what the Persians had done to Athens 150 years earlier. Alexander thought it was a fine idea, and so he and his companions picked up torches, ran around the royal palace, and set fire to it. There are the remains of Persepolis as they are today, there is a representation of the royal palace, as it may have been. That picture on the left is by Sir Joshua Reynolds. It's Tice, the mistress of Ptolemy, 
running around mm. encouraging everyone to set fire to the palace. So the burning of the Persian capital, considered by later writers a great crime. However, as I said, Alexander was capable of great generosity. There's an artificial intelligence image of the meeting between Alexander and the philosopher Diogenes. When Alexander went to Corinth and reconvened the Council of Corinth, he was interested to meet Diogenes, a Greek philosopher, a rather cynical Greek philosopher, somebody who believed in absolute simplicity and who rejected all claims to superiority by other people with scorn. He was one of the few philosophers who made no difference among his followers, whether they were slaves or free, men or women. He regarded all people as absolutely equal. Indeed, he had previously greatly upset Plato. Plato, in a lecture, had defined a man as a creature with two legs. In the next lecture, Diogenes ran in, waving a chicken, saying, I found you a man, Plato. Plato didn't get over that in a hurry. He changed his definition to a featherless biped, but he was angry with Diogenes after that. Anyway, Diogenes ended up in Corinth, living in a wine jar, and Alexander wanted to meet him, so he went searching through the streets of Corinth by himself and eventually found Diogenes, sunning himself by his wine jar, went up to him and said, Oh, Diogenes, I've always wanted to meet you. I'd like to say how greatly I admire you. I'd like to give you a gift. You know, is there anything you want? It doesn't matter how big, doesn't matter how little. And Diogenes said to him, Yes, there's one thing you can do. You can get out of my son. That's the meeting between Diogenes and Alexander. Alexander didn't have his head cut off and stuck on a spear. No, Alexander just put up with that. We then come to his positive achievements. And one of them is his desire to fuse the Persian and the Greek nations. He was, remember, the king of Persia, not by conquest, but by election, or perhaps by inheritance. He ruled Persia not as a conqueror, but as a king of Persia. He dressed in Persian clothes. He had a Persian wife. He kept most of the satraps, the more competent satraps appointed by Darius III, in their positions. He took the Persian generals into his own army. He also insisted in a great ceremony that thousands of his own soldiers should marry Persian wives. He wanted to unite the Greeks and the Persians. He made sure that many thousands of well-born young Persians were taken off and given a full Greek education. Oh yes, Plutarch. When Alexander was taming Asia, Homer became widely read, and the children of the Persians, of the Susianians, and the Gedrosians sang the tragedies of Euripides and Sophocles. And then he instructed all men to consider the inhabited world to be their native land, and his camp to be their acropolis and their defence, while they should regard as kinsmen all good men, and the wicked as strangers. The difference between Greeks and barbarians was not a matter of cloak or shield, or of a dagger or median dress. What distinguished Greekness was excellence, while wickedness was the mark of the barbarian. Clothing, food, marriage, and way of life, they should all regard as common, being blended together by ties of blood and the bearing of children. So Alexander set about uniting the Greeks and the Persians. Let's carry on with Arian. Here in Susa, Alexander received the various officials in charge of affairs in the newly built towns and the governors of the territories he had previously overrun. They brought with them some 30,000 young fellows, all boys of the same age, all wearing the Macedonian battle dress and trained on Macedonian lines. Alexander called them his Epigone, inheritors, and it is said that their coming caused much bad feeling among the Macedonians, 
who felt it was an indication of his many efforts to lessen his dependence for the future upon his own countrymen. And Plutarch picks up from this. The 30,000 boys whom he had left behind under institution and training were now so vigorous in their bodies and so comely in their looks and showed besides such admirable dexterity and agility in their exercises that Alexander himself was delighted. His Macedonians, however, were filled with dejection and fear, thinking that their king would now pay less regard for them. So Alexander had an explicit project of uniting the Greeks and the Persians, and for indeed treating all of his subjects as equals, judging them according to their characters, not according to their original nationality. And he had many thousands of young Persians brought up as Greeks. That explains partly how he managed to populate all of those Greek-speaking cities he founded through his empire. These were not filled up entirely with Greeks from the historic Greek fatherland in the lower Balkan peninsula. They were often filled up with local people who had learned Greek and made themselves into Greeks. But even outside those peoples who were willing to learn Greek and become Greeks, Alexander made sure that he would be obeyed as their own legitimate rulers and that he would rule those people according to their own laws and customs. There's a statue of Alexander from Egypt. That's Alexander the Great as the pharaoh of Egypt. He showed himself to his Egyptian subjects in the garb and the pose of a traditional Egyptian pharaoh. When you have the 10,000 Macedonians who were told to marry Persian wives, that didn't have a universally happy ending. Once Alexander was dead, most of those Macedonians dropped their Persian wives and rejected their own children and went off to look for Macedonian or Greek wives or went back to their Macedonian or Greek wives. Some of them didn't, and one of the most prominent was his general Seleucus, who became one of the great kings in the generation that followed Alexander. He had married a Persian wife, and he kept her. So it was not a universally happy outcome to this attempted fusion of Greeks and Persians, but it was not entirely a failure either. There's Alexandria, one of his greatest long-term achievements. There's a painting from the 18th century of Alexander going about the new buildings of Alexandria, looking at the architectural plans, giving advice and encouragement. There is a map of Alexandria, as it was when Octavian turned up and took Egypt into the Roman Empire, or rather, when Octavian turned up and declared himself the pharaoh of Egypt, a large and wealthy city. And there's a representation of the lighthouse, the first lighthouse, an enormous structure, I think 450 feet tall, that would send a light 50 or 60 miles out into the Mediterranean so ships could make their way to Alexandria at all hours of the day and night. It was built from glass bricks and it survived in working use until about 1200 when one of the Islamic rulers of Egypt listened to a story that there was a great treasure buried underneath it and had it demolished. A great shame that these things happen. India. Oh yes, don't forget India. He didn't just march into India, win a few battles and then go home. For about 500 years after Alexander's departure, this coloured area, India, Pakistan, Afghanistan, that was filled with Greek-speaking cities and Greek kings. They continued deep into the 2nd century AD. Went to Anik Castle a few years ago, and you have the barracks in Anik Castle, and I saw that image dug up in 1891, and it made its way back to England, to the barracks. 
It is a statue of Buddha. But can you see anything about the style of the statue? Does it not look a little Greek to you? Yes. What you have for the next 500 years is a set of kingdoms ruled by Greek-speaking Buddhists. There is a drachma of the Bactrian king, King Menander I, the first ruler in his line to convert to Buddhism. So Alexander's arrival in India was not something, it was not exactly a flying visit in the cultural sense. In the military sense, yes, Alexander turned up, won a battle, and then left and never returned. But he took Greek civilization deep into India, where it continued to flourish for many hundreds of years, a strange fusion of Greek and Indian civilization. What else can I say about Alexander? Until he died in Babylon, his agenda included plans to conquer Italy. And many people, starting with Livy himself, the Roman historian, have speculated on how far Alexander would have got with his conquest of Italy the moment he met the Roman legions, but that's something we'll never know. So I could say so much more about Alexander. It's a subject which has generated libraries of biography and history and general analysis. But that's all I had time to say. Does anybody have any questions?